Messianic Judaism class. For those who are new here, uh, this class was started because we had so many people that were coming from traditional Judaism, having accepted Yeshua as their Messiah and trying to figure out how to do and what to do life and how to get answers. We had those coming from traditional Christianity, trying to figure out what to do with this Jewish Messiah and how do I follow this guy? What from Judaism do I accept? What don't I accept? And we have people coming from no faith background at all, trying to figure it all out. Uh, so we started this class so that we could answer all of the questions people have so that they could start out on a firm foundation as they walk their walk with the Lord. So uh, that is what this class is for. It's 45 minutes every Saturday morning. And uh, we are glad that you are here for, uh, to join with us. If you're watching online and you have a question, you can email me at raveric at britom.org and I will try to answer your question in an upcoming week. If you're in the house, you can just raise your hand uh, and I will an uh, call on you or you can write out your questions or email them to me to give me time to prepare an answer. Uh, before we get to the class. So with all that said, we always open in prayer. Please remember that some of our amazing youth are down or up in Georgia uh, at the retreat. We had 23 that we sent away uh, to retreat this year and we have but we do have a number of our youth that are still here. We have this is going to surprise you, but we have some responsible youth that actually have jobs. And, and can't just get away all the time. So we thank God for our responsible youth and those that weren't able to go for various reasons. But we're glad those that were able to go went and we pray that they have an amazing time with the Lord, that they are impacted in righteous ways and that they return on fire uh, and full of the Ruach HaKodesh. Amen? We also want to pray for Fred. Fred was in the hospital twice this last week, uh, getting, trying to figure out what's going on with his medicine levels. So just pray that they figure out what to do with that. Uh, we need to pray for Jay's uncle. They call him Opa. Uh, he was brought from a hospital to a rehab center and then back to a hospital uh, this week. So we want to pray for him. Skip, uh, we need to pray for him. He's dealing with some kind of a infection or something. Uh, so I pray for him. Pray for Israel. There's a lot going on in Israel and many of you know that uh, in just uh, a little bit of time I'm going to be flying to Israel. Uh, we're going over there not to vacation, not to tour, but to go and pray with, minister to, and provide some resources to some of the believers in Israel that have been affected by this war. We don't talk about it a lot on the news, but there's somewhere about 60,000 or more people from the north that have been uh, had to move out of their homes or get to safe places because of the attacks coming from Lebanon as well as those in the south that are dealing with the Gaza conflict. Many uh, businesses are having struggling times and uh, tourism has dropped off as you can expect during a war. So all of those things are affecting people. A lot of the programs that people can get help from or uh, ministries such as uh, International Fellowship of Christians and Jews and Kufi uh, largely give their money to the Orthodox and the Orthodox do not give money to help the Messianics in the land. So we're going over primarily to visit with, pray with, encourage, love on, and distribute some financial resources directly into the hands of believers. So I want to thank all those that have already given to support uh, doing that and, uh, and thank you to those who will give. And you, if you want to give online and you're watching online, you can go to shalompensacola.com forward slash gives and then just go to the tab that says missions, click on that and then write in the space either rabbi's trip to Israel or gift to Israelis. Either one, if you give gift to Israelis, whatever you give is going to 100% be handed to someone in Israel. Uh, if you put Rabbi's trip, it's going to help with any expenses we have. The balance after expenses, and listen, we're flying cattle car. Uh, we're not flying first class or business class or any. We've got the cheapest tickets we could find. We've got to stay in a hotel for some of the nights. 
we've got a car we had to rent so we could get around and so on so there are some expenses that we have but everything given after the expenses is also going to be given to people so we're not doing this as a money maker a fundraiser for us uh, we're just trying to bless the people of Israel so with that said uh, there's that uh, Lita's birthday is tomorrow, so everybody shout on the count of three. One, two, three. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Lita! We love you, Lita. We're looking forward to the Saturday morning when we see you dance your way up the uh, sidewalk and into the building to join us again for service. Amen. And pray for Israel. For those that may not be paying attention, things are heightening up in Israel uh, for a number of reasons. One is that... Uh, they're having problems with Lebanon, as they've had, but now Iran, because they bombed an Iranian military building in Syria, uh, Iran is threatening to actually attack themselves instead of just doing it through proxies. So we want to pray about that. Also, because of an, a mistake, uh, there were several foreign aid workers, including an American, that were killed uh, in Gaza and so there's a big uproar about that uh, on the and, and not making excuses mistakes happen in war it's unfortunate uh, civilians get killed it's unfortunate that's why we don't like war um, but uh, when the Israeli military investigated or began their investigation they immediately fired the, the commanders the officers in charge of the debacle and uh, so, so we're thankful that they're actually being responsible for that. I would like to see our country begin to be responsible in like manner when our military does something that the leaders of those would not get promoted. Uh, but, be dealt, but that's another issue we have to pray about. But just pray Israel's under heightened security as well as the United States. Um, so with all that said, other prayer requests. Yvonne. First name? Uh, Dean. Dean had a stent put in his heart. And, um, so, he's also drinking, so. And he's also drinking. Now that's not related to the stent in the heart, right? Uh, okay. And then okay. My sister, she's moving up here from South Hollywood, so she's going to be taking a trip from here back down here and picking up the rest of them back here. Oh, wonderful. Your sister's moving closer. Fantastic. Is she moving in with you? No. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Jennifer. I just wondered about the building, the roof, the sale, the whole... Um, the roof, we're still waiting on the check. The Olive Road building, we're waiting on a closing date to get, be given to us. Hasn't, we haven't got the date yet. And the Gotti Lane property, we're still patiently, 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 patiently waiting. But if you win the lottery, we do accept that. That's right, yes. And the other thing is... Yeah, if anybody knows somebody who's wanting to buy a condo in Foley, uh, get with Jennifer. Pay me. Yes, yeah, Cindy had a procedure this week. It doesn't matter. Just a procedure this week. We want to pray for her. Um, someone else had a procedure this week. Glandis, that's right. Glandis had a procedure. She's doing well. I talked to uh, Anthony, so we just need to continue to pray for both of them. Yes, Vance. Yes, uh, gratitude. Uh, my friends who visited here a few weeks ago, Tom and Leanne, and uh, Leanne had that lump on her neck. Yes. Uh, so uh, that prayer group uh, prayed, and that lump has reduced significantly in the last few days. So praise report, we prayed for Leanne a couple of weeks ago uh, in the men's group. She had a lump on her neck. The lump has begun to shrink. We just need to continue to pray until it goes away completely. Amen? Pammy? Yeah, Lori uh, is having pain and struggles. Also, Susie uh, is having problems with her back. Bobsy. Marquita still needs prayer. Uh, continue to pray for her. Yes. Okay, the Wilson family, a lot of them are, are having procedures. And also, Mark family and his friend, Mark has away, and 
the keyhole family, they have a loss in the family. Yes. This prayer for uh, C.W. and his cousin are going to see the eclipse. Yes, C.W. and his cousin are going to see the eclipse. So pray for them as they travel. Marilyn and her back, Jennifer and her everything. (laughs) Jerry has been down with whatever's going around, and there's a lot of our community that have been either getting it, getting over it, so we want to pray for uh, continued prayers for those that have not got it that they will not get it, and those that have it that they would get rid of it. The fire on the west side, I understand at least 16 houses were damaged in that fire, so we want to pray about that. Dave? Uh, continue prayer for myself. And yeah, Dave, for his health. I also, I wanted to uh, thank God for the blessing that I was able to uh, have my grandsons, our grandsons, over for a week. And it's just a blessing when you get to spend time with your grandsons. Amen. Yeah, Dave? Yeah. Multiple neighbors that uh, Dave's ministering to. Amen. Absolutely. TJ, fourth stage cancer. We're praying for healing. What do I need? Um, yes. Safety as I travel is kind of, uh, I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. I'm health-wise. I'm fine. All you know, God blesses. I'm not, uh, you know. So just those safety for my son and I as we travel to Israel. I guess. Yeah. Yes. Son and daughter-in-law moving this month. They're moving where to? Just across town. Across town. Okay. Yvonne. Aaron Church. Okay, brother of a friend who has end-stage melanoma. Yes, Fabio. Um, for the Iranian Christian people that are being persecuted right now. Right, Iranian Christians who are being persecuted as well as the Christians in the Ukraine and in Russia. In the midst of this war, we've forgotten about the people that are being persecuted for their faith around. Pammy? Uh, Pray for Myredna. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so there's, we aren't paying a lot of attention because of other things, but the other things that were going on in the different countries affecting believers is still happening, so let's not forget about that. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, Ashley's mom. Yes. We will be praying for you as you endeavor as you embark on the new move to third grade. All the way through. But I have one in particular who has already been expelled in first grade and has come back I have requested him to be in my class again next year because he needs He needs your love. Well, we will definitely be praying for all of your students. Okay, make up a letter for his first name so we can all be praying for the same person. Just make up one. We don't want to know the. Okay, so remember to pray for C, that God would touch him, and whatever's going on in his life that's causing turmoil, that uh, the Lord would straighten things out so that he can prosper and be blessed. So she knows what it is, but the Lord can work and help Yes, her. absolutely. So, anyone else real quick? Yes. Uh, protection over all the Messianic Jewish people and congregations in the Jewish uh, communities against any uh, of the terrorists that are killing over the country. Amen. Protection against anti-Semitism nationally and internationally and 
So, Abba Father, we just thank you so much for this morning, for your grace and your mercy, for loving us. And uh, we want to stop and just thank you for the millions of things that you did yesterday to be a blessing to us that we aren't even aware of because you were orchestrating things with your sovereignty in uh, ways that we just walked on the paths that you made straight for us. So, Father, we're thankful for that. Abba, we pray for each of these requests, those that are sick, those that need to be strengthened, those that are dealing with medical issues, those that are dealing with doctors trying to figure out treatment plans. Father, that you would be Aronarefecha, the Lord who heals, and that you would heal each one. Father, we pray for Miss Lita as she celebrates her 87th birthday, and we just ask that you would continue to strengthen her so she can uh, return to coming to service with us. We'd be able to worship alongside of her. Father, we pray for Israel, pray for the U.S. We pray for the Russian-Ukraine conflict to end with a peaceful uh, settlement. We pray for those that are being persecuted in Africa and Egypt and different countries around the world for their faith, including the United States and Canada. Father, we're thankful that you are working, that you are sovereign. We know that your word is going to come to pass, so we see these things and we know that uh, prophecy is being fulfilled. We want to be part of the restoration that you're working, and we want to be faithful to your plan. We don't want to pray against what you're doing. We want to pray alongside what you're doing. And we thank you for all that you are doing in Yeshua's name. Amen. So uh, a couple of things I would ask uh, that, first of all, I'm not going to say when I'm leaving and when I'm coming back on video. Uh, If you actually do want to know, I'll be glad to tell you after uh, service. But when I'm gone, uh, I ask that you would please uh, call my wife, text her, go to coffee with her. Uh, You don't have to buy, although I wouldn't complain if you did, but, uh, but just, you know, make sure she's not... Uh, she's going to be, you know, a wife with a husband in a war zone. So please be aware of that. Um, continue to pray for our young people as they're in re- the retreat. Uh, and uh, we're truly blessed by that. Continue to pray for the, the buildings to close and everything so we can become debt free here. Which, uh, yeah, and the roof get taken care of, all those things. Uh, so... I have a couple of questions that came. Um, One comes from Vance, who's here this morning. He said, uh, in Leviticus 10.1, assuming that Aaron's sons, uh, Nadav and Avihu, thought they were doing something that would be pleasing to Adonai when they offered unauthorized fire incense, which had not been commanded, there must be some lesson for us even today from this account. Please help me to understand what this is and how I would apply this lesson to my life. Um, We don't know exactly what happened uh, in that situation. I have my opinion because it says they offered unauthorized fire uh, for the incense. The incense were commanded by God to be lit using fire from the altar of sacrifice. Uh, I think that they went in and they just took the fire from the menorah and lit the incense with it. They used the wrong fire to light the incense and God was displeased with that for a number of reasons. But one of them is that the fire was supposed to start with, you have to remember, the altar of sacrifice God lit himself. You know, they they prepared the altar, God sent fire, the altar started burning. God did that and provided that fire. And I think that uh, there's a lesson in that that there's supposed to be that whenever we offer incense to the Lord, which I think in our lives today is our prayer and our praise, there's a reason the altar of incense is the only one of the articles in the tabernacle that had two rings instead of four. Uh, and I've talked about this before. If you have four rings in a box, when you go uphill, the box goes slanted with you uphill. When you go downhill, the box goes slanted downhill. It changes directions as you go, walking with it. Uh, The altar of incense had two rings on the corners, which meant when you walked uphill, it stayed level, and when you walked downhill, it stayed level. 
And I think that if we understand the concept that our prayers and our praise when we do it right help us to remain level regardless whether we're going up the mountain or down the mountain and that God provided a way to do that but that our prayer and praise has to be ignited by God and his will and his purpose and not by our own selfishness, our own desires or our own laziness. Sometimes we pray after something happens because we were too lazy to prepare before it happened. And uh, I think if we learn to pre-pray, we won't be uh, we we won't be in that condition uh, as much. Uh, so I think that's why this happened. Now the lesson today is uh, I think that there matter of fact there was a book written um, and I forget who wrote it, but the title of it was Strange Fire, uh, and it was about uh, man-induced charismatic expression. Uh, not God-induced. I'm a firm believer in the workings of the Holy Spirit. I'm a believer in the miraculous. I'm a believer in the gifts of the Spirit. I'm a believer in all of those things. But I think that when it's uh, man-ignited instead of God-ignited, then it becomes an issue. And that's something we need to be aware of. There are those. I went to a church one time. They had invited me to speak I didn't know anything about them. When I walked in the door, they handed me a paper with the tongue message for the day. That you were just, and it had some gibberish on the paper. And that was, this is the, today's tongue message. And when the appropriate time, you'll read this. And I said, uh, I won't be here for that. So, and, and I left because that's not how God works. If God does something miraculous, God does it miraculous. Uh, we don't deal with things that way. So anyhow, I think strange fire has to do with not being ignited by God's spirit and our doing things. And that doesn't just relate to the supernatural. But there's a lot of times we do things that we think are going to be pleasing to God that are actually against God's purpose because it comes from our wisdom instead of his wisdom. And so when we do things, we have to do it that way. Timothy. And then there was a hand over here too. So. Yeah, they were, they, Nadab and Abihu are, are mentioned in godly ways previous to this. And so it's important to note these are not, like the only time we hear about Nadab and Abihu isn't when they're sinning. They were consecrated unto God. They were chosen by God. They were called by God to come fellowship with him, with Moses. These are not two nobodies that happen to do something wrong. And we need to be understanding also Nadab and Abihu were Kohanim who served alongside Aaron. Okay, so these were the religious leaders of Israel who did this, which is one of the reasons it was such a significant punishment that God wrought, because leaders have an accountability before God that is higher than uh, just followers, just members. So it's really important that we understand some of these concepts we learn from this. This wasn't God having a bad day and, you know, something happened. This was a significant thing that God was teaching uh, in this, in this uh, action. Ivana? The altar of sacrifice was where... God lit the fire. The light of the menorah was not was supposed to keep being refilled so it doesn't go out. The incense they lit new because incense burns out and then you re refill it and start it over again. Yeah, haven't you ever burned incense? You're from that generation. <laughs> According to tradition, that altar remained burning even when they carried it and wherever they went, it never, even in the rain, it didn't go out. Uh, but that's because God started it. And if God starts something, then the powers of the world can't stop it. Amen. So, any other on that topic? Okay, next question came from Christy. 
And she said, do you think that unauthorized holidays would be parallel to unauthorized fire since they're not the ones that Adonai commanded? What an interesting question. So, so my, my first, my initial response was a very short yes. But as I contemplated it, there are unauthorized holidays that we celebrate. Uh, that God didn't say, like Purim. God didn't say celebrate Purim. The scripture says from then on they celebrated Purim. It didn't say it was a bad thing they did it, but it wasn't commanded by God. Um, Hanukkah is another one that's not commanded by God, uh, but it is something that we celebrate. Uh, so, so those things. I don't think necessarily birthdays are a bad uh, thing. And, and just as I say that, remember that June 6th, June 3rd is my wife's birthday. Uh, so, and I've been reminded about that since January because she starts six months ahead <laughs> to let me know that, that her birthday is coming up. I understand it's also ironically her sister's It's also ironically her sister's birthday. So. so anyhow, so birthdays, anniversaries, there's really nothing in the Bible that says you should celebrate your anniversary. But I would encourage all of, at least the men, to at least acknowledge that day in, in some way. So, so when we talk about unauthorized holidays, I think that my determination in is an unauthorized holiday parallel to unauthorized fire would be holidays that replaced or things that replaced or changed what God established. Uh, and I, I, it happens to be I wrote a blog about that this week, and if you haven't read it, I encourage you to go to and read it. But there are, and we were talking about in, in my blog, the Easter Passover thing, and there are a zillion reasons not to celebrate Easter. And you can look online and find out all kinds of things. Some is good history and some is quasi-history and all those kind of things. But I think that honestly, the reason to not celebrate Easter is because Easter historically uh, was started as a way to not celebrate the resurrection during Passover. It was a purposeful replacement, and you can find it's written. This is not something that somebody on the Internet said. We can actually read the documentation at, that it was put that way so that the celebration of the resurrection wouldn't happen during a Jewish holiday. Uh, that caused division in the body of those who believed in the resurrection, from those who believed that in the resurrection and that God gave a day and a time for it to do that. Uh, I think that that is an example of unauthorized fire, replacing God's holy days with something else. Um, I think that another example of similar is, and listen to me when I say this because it's important that you actually hear what I'm saying, communion can be that way uh, because if you are if communion is a remembrance of what Yeshua did on Passover and you are saying I'm doing this because it helps me to remember what he did on Passover but I'm also going to do Passover the actual thing that he said when you do this do it in remembrance of me then communion is fine it's just an additional reminder of what it is, as long as you don't get into the quasi-transubstantiation and all that stuff that came later. But if you're doing communion and you don't do Passover, then communion, in my mind, becomes uh, unauthorized fire. It becomes a replacement for something that God commanded in his word. And so we, I, I think that those are things that, that blur the picture of who God is what he did, what Messiah did, the purpose of his word in giving us a, a, the Torah to lead us to Messiah so that we can find him. These things were established so that as they happened prophetically, God's, the people would see what God did and they would recognize who Yeshua was because of it. So I think that those are examples of unauthorized fire, but I would not say that all unauthorized celebrations uh, would be unauthorized fire because some of them do not detract from the things that God established and God put in his word and intended. So, so that's the answer to that. Timothy had a question. I think you talked about it from last week, so I don't want 
Okay. But it's about the sacrifices, and I just want to, you don't mind just briefly summarizing. We are going to do sacrifices, I understand. Yeah, I believe that we will, that when the temple is reestablished, however that happens, whether it's a temple being rebuilt or the temple coming down from heaven or however that happens, uh, there will be sacrifices made in the new temple. And how do you come to say that that's true? Because there's a lot of people who say Yeshua did away with all those because he's our ultimate sacrifice. Okay, and again, and I said this last week, I'm going to repeat it this week because there are people here and I'm sure there are people watching. And if you, if you are interested in this topic, last week I spent a lot more time on it. Look at last week's Foundations class also. The apostles and disciples continued to make sacrifices in the temple, continued to make trips back to Jerusalem. Paul, at the risk of his life, got on ships and went across the ocean in wintertime storms in order to get back to Jerusalem to participate in the sacrificial system. If Paul thought that the sacrificial system was done away with because of Yeshua's death, there's no way in the world he would have, at risk of life, got on a boat so he could rush back and do something that was unnecessary and meaningless. Uh, when he came to Jerusalem, he met with the leadership of the Jerusalem uh, community, and they said, people are saying you're teaching Jewish people not to obey the law of Moses. So what we want you to do is go make a sacrifice for yourself and for these four other men at, so that they can end their vow to prove that that's not what you're teaching. Now, either the disciples are the biggest hypocrites in the world or they didn't get the memo that the sacrificial system was over with or the sacrificial system was not done away with because of the death of Messiah. Um, and I lean toward the third one. I don't think that God used the people to write the New Testament and they were all without understanding of the New Covenant. When you do, Zechariah says, every nation is going to have to send representatives to Jerusalem to participate in Sukkot, and participation in Sukkot is making the sacrifices for Sukkot. There will be a priesthood reestablished in the temple. There's no reason for a priesthood without having a sacrificial system. There's, if, if, the evidence is overwhelming that there will, and there's, the other thing is, and I see your hand, John, it'll probably go dead before I get to you, so. Um, <laughs> Um, the, the, the other thing is that, um, that we need to recognize that the sacrifices actually accomplished everything the sacrifices were intended to accomplish before the temple was destroyed. In other words, if you brought a sin offering to the temple, it wasn't just a waste of time. It wasn't just a figurative connection. It wasn't just pretending to do something until the real happened. When you brought a sin sacrifice to the temple, it did exactly what God said it would do. The atonement sacrifice did exactly what the atonement sacrifice was supposed to do. Cover sin from year to year to year until the sacrifice of Yeshua, which made that sacrifice once and for all time. So a lot of people say it was like the, sin, the sacrificial system was like Monopoly. You know, use, it's a fake system until the real one was engaged. It's not. It, when you made a thanksgiving offering, you were actually demonstrating gratefulness and thanksgiving toward God. It wasn't a pretend until you could really be thankful. And if you say, if we're going to do this with the temple, last part of the question. When the temple, I guess my understanding is, when it does first get rebuilt, it, it is going to be a, an incorrect governance in that temple until Yeshua comes to take his place there. Is that correct? Absolutely. There, and, and depends on your eschatology, how things work out, but there, it appears that there are humans involved in the leadership once again, just like they were when Yeshua was here. We have to remember, this is not that out of the ordinary because the political appointed priests in the day of Yeshua were not the ones who were supposed to be doing that. They were a corrupted priesthood. And, but here's important. 
Even though the priesthood was corrupted, it appeared God accepted the sacrifices of the people because the people's hearts were right even if the priests' hearts were not. So there's all that that goes into that equation. John. So in Hebrews 8.13 where it's talking about the uh, new covenant, the first is old and uh, that which decayeth waxes old and is ready to vanish away. What is vanishing? Okay, first of all, this is a great question. And, and for those that aren't listening, or aren't here in the room to listen, he, his question was in Hebrews 8.13, where it's talking about the new covenant, uh, it's a, and, and he says something is waxing old and getting ready to go away. Uh, what is this talking about? Okay, first of all, the word covenant's not in that verse. It doesn't exist in the Greek. It was added there by commentators to try to help you to understand their point of view of what's happening here. Hebrews is written somewhere around 65 or 68. It's some 30 years after the destruction of the temple, and they're still making sacrifices. So, so the idea that the sacrificial system was done away with isn't even taken into effect in Hebrews because they're still making sacrifices. There's still the Kohen making the sacrifice. So Hebrews is, again, confirming what I just said, that the sacrificial system wasn't done away with by the death of Messiah. What did happen is in verse, huh? It happened 30 years after the death of Messiah, not after the Right, after the death of Messiah. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, what does happen here is, again, this can't be new covenant, old covenant, because the covenant came into effect at the death of the covenanter. When Yeshua died, the new covenant began. So this can't be talking Old Covenant, New Covenant, or else Hebrews is written 30 years late with an expectation that something that had already happened was going to happen sometime in the future. So what does happen directly after this verse was written? The temple is destroyed. The priesthood is eradicated. What was old that's becoming new? Start at chapter 6 and read on. The entire dissertation from Hebrews 6 to Hebrews 8 and 9 is about the change of priesthood, not the change of covenant. It's talking about the difference between the Aaronic priesthood and the Melchizedekan priesthood and the shift. That which is getting old and getting ready to wax away is the Aaronic priesthood. They're all destroyed, wiped out with the de <coughs> destruction of the temple. That which is new that's replacing is Yeshua's priesthood in Melchizedekan fashion. So that's the explanation, Jennifer. Back to the original question that Tim asked. Paul was having to pay for these four men's... Sacrifice, yes. Is that acceptable? Absolutely. You can pay for anybody's side. They have to... Yeah, but isn't it supposed to be something that you are... No, no yes and no. It's yes. What, what that was is if... If you didn't have the money to pay for your sacrifice, I could buy your sacrifice. Then you would have to take that sacrifice in. That sacrifice then becomes yours, and you make the choice of what to do with that. Uh, and, and so it's not that Paul couldn't do that according to the law. You could buy the animals for whoever you wanted to. That was your giving an offering to be a blessing to someone else so they could do what they needed to do. So it's a matter of participating. Paul also had to buy a sacrifice for himself and do it. But no, that's not against Torah for him to buy or against God's word. But There's I can see people taking advantage of something like that. Oh, people take advantage of everything. That doesn't mean that the original wasn't right. It just means that people are wrong. They think they're fooling I don't think these I don't I think the people who fake things think they're think they're getting away with it. Well, yeah, I think that people, you know, there's, there's people who sit there and watch porn in their room and, and think that God doesn't see it. So, yeah. Andrew, your question, please. Okay, um, the, the verse that says a husband of one wife 
um, means one wife at a time, not just one wife. Um, because the truth is, if you take it the other way, if somebody ha has a wife and she dies, and then he gets married again, he can be disqualified because he had more than one wife. That, that's not what it's talking about. And I encourage you greatly, if you're interested in that particular topic, Anna and I did a video series on marriage, divorce, and remarriage from a biblical viewpoint, and I encourage you to watch it. Um, so it, it's, it, it's eye-opening for those that have questions about what the Bible actually says on that topic. Um, so I have, I have no problem with somebody who was married, who got divorced for biblical reasons, becoming a leader in a community uh, and doing ministry. I have absolutely no problem with that happening. Um, I do have a problem with people who get divorced unbiblically and, uh, and then jump in without any signs of repentance, fruit of repentance, fruit of restoration, those kind of things. And I think that we need to be aware of that. And I think that there's a lot of abuse in that situation. Uh, and you can just read in the newspaper the many places where that's going on right now. Yes. Yes. Um, I, think it is, I think it is true that they're planning on doing something if they can. I think it's very much hype that they're doing it. I think that when God's ready, there's, first of all, yeah, first of all, here's, the, here's some of the problems. First of all, the red heifer offering was for the sanctification of the priests, not the sanctification of the temple. Second, it was done outside of Jerusalem. It's purposely said you have to take it outside of the camp, outside of where the tabernacle is to make this sacrifice. These folks have set up an altar in Jerusalem in the temple area, not the temple mount, but the temple area. They built an altar made of stones that had been cut and formed there. The Bible says the altar had to be made of stu stones that didn't get cut by tools. There's, uh, the, the stuff going on here is so hokey and out of place, and people are eating it up like it was ice cream and, or bread after Passover. There, and, and so we just need to be, when, when and if there is a time for a red heifer to appear, for a sanctification of the priesthood and all that, God will provide a red heifer. They won't have to fly the babies, in, you know, fly the moms in from Texas to Israel so they can do that. The, the only thing that's redeeming, in my opinion, and I could be wrong, please, I've been wrong before. The only thing redeeming about this whole thing is people are talking about the fact that there are Old Testament scriptures that are relevant to us today. Yeah. And, uh, and those things. So, so that's redeeming because people are having conversations. But all of this hype is just that. And if you didn't see it yesterday, I made a post about earthquakes and yeah. eclipses and... I, you know, I could be wrong. We could all be gone Monday. You know, it's possible. However, um, there are 55, I think, earthquakes every day around the world. Every day. Not, not like this is the fact that there was an earthquake yesterday is not surprising. There are 55 a day that take place in the world for years and years and years. 55 a day. This is not. We should not be shocked that there are earthquakes. Uh, the eclipse, we knew that was happening a long time ago. It didn't sneak up on us. If an eclipse, like if we're standing here one day, like they were on the time of Yeshua, where suddenly it became dark for three hours, I think we should take notes. Okay? But something that is happening that we do, is it relevant? Absolutely everything in God's creation is relevant, and everything God does speaks to us about his scripture. But I think that this is quasi-financial... Uh, I think that there's profits with an F making a lot of money off of things that they're proclaiming are profits with the PH. And there is like 30 seconds left, so Timothy. Regarding the elders and all that, would you, 
would you say if somebody says that seems to be like a new established system that Paul was creating? No, we there were elders in synagogues before Paul became born. There, 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 there's the guy that if you read in the scripture it says they handed the scroll to Yeshua. The guy that handed the scroll was an elder in that synagogue. That was his job, is to to, to hand the scroll to the person that's doing it. So there, all of that was established long before. When we talk about bishops in the New Testament and we talk about elders and deacons, those were uh, already established positions that have Hebrew names that long existed before Paul wrote them down. So with that, we're going to break for the day. I hope you enjoyed it. Please share this with other people.